You recording again? I am, as a matter of fact, yes. Did you get that? We're just gonna no, I didn't, off. sadly, but... Oh, come on. Don't fall over. Come on. But point. My, my, the uh, picture. What's that? Should I move? Oh, no, it's fine. I'm pretty sure you're in all of the ones <laughs> on the online. Yeah, I think so, there. right. Except the one that was recorded for you. Right. Yeah, you're not in that. You're actually it's in that. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, you're in that too, actually. Yeah. You ought to cut it up just uh -huh. record it. <laughs> what, we, what we should do is record Dr. Harmon watching the video of Dr. Harmon teaching about oh, Russia. the Infinite Dr. Harmon project. <laughs> exactly! Yeah. <laughs> I actually went to that. I like that. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's awesome. It's very enjoyable. I want to see some like stitch all those together. Yeah, yeah, yeah that could be like a movie, right? You just need to yeah. figure out yeah. like all the things yeah. that involve drawing dotted lines and have Harmon do that on camera. That way we can speed it up. <laughs> Since I don't want that thing to fall over. Uh, use advanced prepping technology here. We need to Except. film you drawing lots of other things with dotted lines. Yeah. That way right. you have a compilation. Yeah, I don't want to mush this either. Huh. I know. I'll just put this here so if it does fall, it won't hard fall. It'll just kind of maybe <laughs> snap. All right. Oh, just don't disturb it. I'm scared. <laughs> So this is going to be the most exciting video ever. <laughs> is it recording? It is, oh, yes. Awesome. Hi, Mallory. <laughs> Hi, future Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Just be just smart. Future Mark. Say, hey, pass cell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Actually, I did hate pass cell. Wait, so if future Mark isn't there, are you pass Mark or present Mark? Well, there's no objective now, but <laughs> Yes, we are. Then we'll be talking. But right now we're PowerPointing. I'm going to do my PowerPointing exercise. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever, um, are you familiar with Stephen Gold's explanation for why they don't have 400 hitters in baseball anymore? Uh, oh, uh, okay. First, I have to properly interpret what he said. First, I was like, well, they never had 400 people. Okay, good. No, no, are you familiar with that? No, I don't think so. It's no. really interesting because we were talking about it in um, last Tuesday. Because uh, we're talking about how like biologists will interpret changes in means as some sort of trend, as like progress, right? Like adaptation, progress for um, within some sort of like species. Yeah. And he was talking about he was drawing a parallel to like his explanation for why there is no um, no 400 hitters anymore. The last one was in like the 40s. Uh, Teddy Williams, mm -hmm. um, and I guess like his explanation for it goes that back in the at the beginning of baseball, um, the better hitter like everyone's been getting better overall. So mm -hmm. pitchers are getting better and hitters are getting better. Right. So at the beginning, um, in the early years, you had much more spread. So like the distribution of batting averages was like sh like more like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, you had more people in the more the tail. range, but mm -hmm. you also had people down lower in like the 100, less than 100 range. But I mean, more hitters and pitchers are getting better, so that spread is getting like this. Mm -hmm. So because what's interesting is the mean hasn't changed. Oh really? Oh, it's out 2.6. Oh, I thought the mean had gone down. No, it hasn't. Oh, that's what you would expect to see it, like just say like pitchers were getting better. Right. That's what mm -hmm. you expect to see, but it hasn't. It hasn't changed. Ah, it's that a standard gross. deviation. Huh? Yeah. So it's really interesting. Well, that is interesting. Yes. Indeed so. And this is Vera C. Rubin. Hey, old um, connection. What's that? Old connection. Old connection, that's right. Yes, because I have to talk about the old connection there with. Um, Are they doing cosmology now? Uh, no.
No, not quite. We are doing galaxies. galaxies. Yes, we're doing galaxies. Messed up. Be burned out on the video, but I'm sure Mallory's just looking at the slides at the same time anyway, so it's fine. So there's Vera C. Rubin, who um, actually came to Ohio Wesleyan because we gave her an honorary degree some years ago. And you probably realize that I'm showing this because of the famous paper that she published with uh, W. Ken Ford called Rotation of the Andromeda Nebula from a Spectroscopic Survey of Emission Regions. And they cause it the Andromeda Nebula. I always call it the Andromeda Galaxy, but this is long after we knew it was a galaxy, but people were still calling it the Andromeda Nebula for a long time. Um, so this was, uh, uh, what were the dates on this? It was, yeah, it's 1970, yeah, received 1969, July 7, revised 1969, August 21, and published in February of 1970. It was received 13 days before the Apollo 11 landed on the moon. I never thought of that before. Wow, cool. <laughs> Good to point that out. And it was, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, that, that, nothing. Okay. So anyway, observations of the emission region, section two. The DTM image tube spectrograph was used on the 72-inch telescope of the Ohio State at the Ohio Wesleyan University's at Lowell Observatory, blah, 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 blah. For the Perkins telescope, the scale perpendicular to the dispersion is 40 arc seconds per millimeter, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, she made these observations with the original Perkins telescope of H2 regions in the Andromeda galaxy. And in particular, she was measuring their Doppler shifts. And what she determined was that the rotation curve is pretty much flat. Uh, in other words, evidence for dark matter. So. Uh, there's the original Perkins telescope, and I should really take a picture of the one that's on the wall at with UV. at with which <laughs> at, at uh, Perkins, so that we could be showing Dr. Trees at this point. I was telling the perspective that I was saying that if you come here, you'll meet Dr. Trees, and then you'll realize that he's timeless because this is also Dr. Trees back in the 1930s or whatever. Uh, there's the Perkins telescope in its new home. Here is what we would expect for the rotation curve of our galaxy, if most of the mass was concentrated in the center, the pink dashed line or red dashed line or whatever would show Keplerian orbits, right? In our solar system, uh, the further away you are from the sun, the slower the planets are moving um, because of the fact that the gravity is getting weaker the further you go out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the blue curve there is the rotation curve of our galaxy, um, that that's our galaxy right there, that um, um, shows that in fact, except for the innermost part of the galaxy, it's pretty much horizontal. It's fairly flat, and so this is telling us that the mass in our galaxy is not concentrated near the center, but the point is that the rotation curve stays flat even out to the edge of the visible disk. So when Vera Rubin took these measurements of the Andromeda galaxy, even when you start to get to the regions where there's very little visible light being emitted, the rotation curve is still flat. But if you assume that mass is distributed the same way light is, that should not be the case. The rotation speed should be falling off when you get far from the center if indeed mass is distributed the same way light is. Well, it's not is how, is how we interpret that, that we have dark matter. So here's rotation curves at, of a bunch of spiral galaxies. And um, in other words, the results for the Andromeda galaxy held up upon observing traditional galaxies. It's very typical for spiral galaxies that they have nearly flat rotation curves. And so that was the first really good evidence for dark matter. There had been earlier hints about dark matter that were not that well-founded observationally, it turns out, uh, although they turned out to be right in the end. Um, now we have additional evidence for dark matter. So for example, here is galaxy cluster Abel 1689 from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the way that we see evidence for dark matter in this galaxy cluster is pretty cool. Namely, we see these blue arcs. I don't know how we can see them from back there, but there are these blue arcs in the image 
that are actually multiple images of the same distant background galaxy. And there's multiple examples of arcs that are all images of the same distant background galaxy because what is happening is those are way beyond, behind, way far beyond where Abel 1689 is. And gravitational lensing, as the light passes through the gravity, through the curved space time in the vicinity of Abel 1689, is what's producing those multiple images. And um, if you infer how much matter is there, uh, from how much space-time is being curved to produce that gravitational lensing, you find that it's way more mass than you can account for from the visible light output of all those galaxies, assuming that the mass-to-light ratio, as it's called, is similar to what it is for um, stars and so forth observed in the, in the uh, disk of our galaxy. So additional evidence for the existence of dark matter. So then the question becomes, well, what's dark matter made of? And if we knew the answer to that, we would be celebrating a either future Nobel Prize or the Nobel Prize that was just awarded to the folks that figured out the answer to that. We don't know exactly what dark matter is. So different candidates would be, well, maybe it is so-called machos, massive compact halo objects. And the idea there would be that neutron stars and black holes and white dwarfs all have quite a lot of mass, right? They're stellar mass objects, but they don't emit nearly as much light as a star does. And so if there were lots and lots of these machos in the halo of a galaxy like ours, they would have lots of mass and not a whole lot of light. And so there was a macho project that was dedicated to looking for machos via gravitational lensing. The idea would be uh, you would observe stars in, for example, the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a nearby dwarf galaxy that orbits the Milky Way that is well beyond the Milky Way itself. And so if one of these machos in the halo of our galaxy happens to drift between us and the line of sight to a star in the Large Magellanic Cloud, it turns out that you would expect, due to gravitational lensing, a temporary brightening of that star as seen from Earth. And that's because the gravitational lensing is having something of a focusing effect. And here are actual observations of brightenings of stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud as machos passed in front of them. So yes, there are machos in the halo of our galaxy. Some of the dark matter is machos, however, the conclusion from the Macho Project is that while there is some ordinary matter that is dark matter, Machos, it's not nearly enough to account for all the dark matter. It's only a minor component of it. Null results are important. It's not a null result, but in other words, you know, that they were hoping in some sense to show that the dark matter is Machos because then they'd be the people that figured out what dark matter is. Well, they showed some dark matters machos, but definitely not most of it. That's an important <laughs> result too, of course. Maybe not as fun as finding out what dark matter is, but it deepened the mystery. Yes? How do we know how much, or how many machos, how much machos? Well, you can, you can infer from the rate at which you observe these brightenings. You can infer so from that. So not all dark matter does this? this uh, only machos. So okay. to, to get this kind of brightening, you need a small object to pass along the line of sight to the star. A, 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 a cloud would not cause this to happen, for example. A, a gas cloud would not cause this to happen. We would see gas clouds in other ways, like for example, a 21 centimeter radiation of those gas clouds. So we already knew it wasn't gas clouds. So the smallness, the, the, the fact that they're little compact solar objects on the order of a few solar masses, mass to solar mass to solar masses to a few solar masses. That's what would be required to produce this kind of brightening by the gravitational lensing. So then from the rate of macho-induced brightenings, you can infer the density of machos in the halo, and then from that figure out an estimate of how much mass is in the halo in the form of these things. The answer is not nearly enough to account for all the dark matter, because the dark matter um, 
overall appears to be about six times more abundant than ordinary matter in the cosmos. It's, there's a lot more of the so-called dark matter than there is of quote unquote ordinary matter. Now, of course, if, if there's more dark matter than ordinary matter, aren't we the extraordinary matter? But, well, we're used to thinking of ourselves as normal, and so baryonic matter like you and I are made of is considered <coughs> ordinary matter. Dark matter is extraordinary matter. Is it? Is this, this would, so machos are baryonic dark matter, but most of the dark matter is non-baryonic. Yes? That's kind of what I was gonna ask. What are these? You said a few solar masses? They would be uh, white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. Right. So black holes, you know, like two, three solar masses, or there some, some are bigger, but stellar, stellar black holes are typically a couple solar masses. Neutron stars, remember, can get up to around 2.8 solar masses. Um, white dwarfs could get up to about 1.44 solar masses. So, in other words, they are on the order of a solar. Mass. Possible forms of dark matter. It could be baryonic, protons, neutrons, electrons, quote unquote ordinary matter. Uh, ordinary matter composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Why, I'm baryonic matter, you're baryonic matter, we're all baryonic matter, oh, 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 or something like that. It's, what's the matter with me? Anyway, it's fourth hour or third hour. Oh, it's third hour, right? Yeah, but if yes. you accumulate through the week, never mind. Anyway, uh, brown dwarfs, oh yeah, I forgot brown dwarfs would also be included. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying. Brown dwarfs are there too, yeah, because those are also uh, fairly massive things that don't produce a lot of light. So, uh, brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes. Collectively, they are machos or massive compact halo objects because everything needs to have a huge acronym. It's very important. You could have non baryonic dark matter. So, one possibility would be so called hot dark matter. And in this context, hot means relativistic particles, cold means non-relativistic particles. So are they moving fast, are they not moving fast? Hot dark matter, particles moving at relativistic speeds, the best candidate would be neutrinos. We now know that neutrinos do have mass, and uh, we used to, for a long time we thought they were massless, now we know that they do have mass, but it's not enough to account for most of the dark matter. So there is some hot dark matter, but it's definitely not the primary component because the neutrino mass is not large enough for it to account for a significant portion of the dark matter. Why then we could also have cold dark matter, and those who might have had cosmology in the past realize that that's what we think it is now, the so-called standard model is Lambda CDM, in other words, when we get to cosmology in here, we'll talk more about that. The dominant components of the energy density of the universe are lambda, dark energy, cosmological constant, could be a cosmological constant, but in any case, it goes by the name of lambda, capital lambda for these purposes. CDM, cold dark matter, is the second most important component of the universe. And then there's so-called, quote unquote, ordinary matter. In one of the homework problems, uh, that is due next Friday, not tomorrow, um, you will estimate how much dark matter is in our solar system and how much is in our, how much is in the orbit of Pluto, how much is in the Earth. You will find that there is very little dark matter in the solar system. Even though dark matter dominates the universe uh, in terms of the matter content, dark energy is more important it turns out, but even though dark matter dominates the matter content of the universe, that's not true locally. It makes up for in volume what it lacks in density. There's very little dark matter in the solar system. The reason why there's so much dark matter in the universe is because it's spread out very thinly over galactic halos around galaxies. So it, it, there's lots and lots of volume that more than makes up for very low density. So sometimes people think, oh, we must be swarming in dark matter around no, we would know that. We would feel its gravitational effects if dark matter were important in the solar system. So particles moving at non-relativistic speeds. Um, if you're gonna have machos, you need to have wimps. Actually, I think wimps came first and then the macho. I, I can't remember which one was first, but whichever one came first, the other one was named to contrast with 
idea with, with that. So WIBs are weekly interacting, uh, that we'll find out soon. Weekly first, yes. <laughs> yes, right. WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. Those are, whoops, <laughs> that in fact is the leading candidate. That they are uh, elementary particles that are uh, very massive, um, but that only interact weakly via the weak nuclear force and via gravity, which is why we don't see them. Because obviously, if they had a high cross section for interaction with baryonic matter, we would have detected them by now because they don't. So did you find out? Machos were named later than WIMPs. Okay, so machos were named in deference to the WIMPs, to contrast with the WIMPs, yes, okay. All right, so, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention that in the homework, you'll explore how we can determine the distribution of dark matter within, say, our galaxy. And the basic idea is that, turn this because right now, right now Mallory is only seeing the screen and I'm sure that Mallory would like to see the board too, right Mallory? And she would really like to see Mark's head. <laughs> All right. Who wouldn't? <laughs> what? No, who wouldn't? That's right, yes. basic idea is that you assume that it's spherically distributed, right? So here is, well it seems to be when we, when we invert the distributions from clusters of galaxies and when we look at orbital speeds, a, a, a spherical distribution seems like a reasonable inference. <coughs> so galaxy, dark matter halo, something that's moving in the halo. And it could be within the disk of the galaxy too, for that matter. In other words, we can explore the rotation curve of the galaxy, for example. Okay. How then, what's that? How thick is that halo? Does it go through the entire, uh, like, enclosed area? Yeah, what I've, brought, what I've, what I've drawn is a little so sketch here. It's pretty accurate, actually. Yeah, it's, it, it extends well beyond the physical, the, like, the, the size of the galaxy where you see light. That of a depiction, as a matter of fact. So, there's out to radius r, m sub r, mass enclosed. And for simplicity, because we feel that dark matter dominates, let's just ignore the mass of the galaxy itself and assume most of the contribution is coming from the dark matter. Then, Mass of the galaxy is a small perturbation. Yeah, um, right. It's only a few, like, a few, what, like, 100 billion solar masses or something like that. Like, so, what will we do here? So, if this thing is moving on a circular orbit at a certain speed, what equation do I write down for? Kepler's third law. Kepler's, well, I could do that, or let's write down, but, well, but Kepler's third law, no, I don't do that because that's assuming that all the mass is concentrated in the center. So let, yeah, we do the mv squared over r, right? So if this is a little thing of mass m, mv squared over r is equal to, it is, well, it's, it's m times a, but in other words, what is the force on that thing? It's the gravitational force, and if we assume it's all coming from the dark matter, G, big M, R, sub R, uh -huh. little M over R squared over R squared. Right. So that, um, that allows us to figure out how much mass is interior to radius R. And so those, you know, those, those light curves, I mean those rotation curves allow you to figure out how much mass is interior to radius R. And um, then uh, I remember that if the, you should look more carefully at the homework problems, if they, if they have you to do 
use this or not? You can you just do a homework problem? Is that, yeah, we could, we could end up kind of semi doing a homework problem here. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> if if v is equal to a constant, right, and that's what it would be, that's what we would get for a flat rotation curve. You mean for like any r? Huh? For any r? Yeah, if v is independent of radius, which is what, whoops, I'm in the wrong direction, which is what a rotation curve <coughs> like this is saying. To a good approximation, v is independent of radius when you get out there, right? Then that says that m sub r is going to be, um, it's going to be what? Uh, r times g over v squared, right? Am I doing that right? Terms cancel. r is g, uh, 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 yeah, no. r is v v v v v v v Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, right. Let's try this again. <laughs> r v squared over g, is that right? Yes. <laughs> To like pressure up your RV squared over G, right? <laughs> and it's going to be documented permanently. That's right. It's going to be. Oh, well, that's what the YouTube video editor is for. <laughs> now, as you can see here from this equation, I wrote right. That's right. This is why you should come to OU. <laughs> yes. You can be misinformed on a daily basis. You just edit it, and then you're just solving Schrodinger equations blindfolded. Like it's no big deal. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, so. And this is when we introduce the stress energy tensor. <laughs> <laughs> right. Meanwhile, let's say that I've got a, a spherical shell. <coughs> Excuse me of radius r, thickness dr, containing mass d sub <coughs> dm of r. A little bit of mass in there, right? Is it all the mass interior or just in the little shell? m of r inside dm of r is how much mass is in between r and r plus dr. Then in terms of the local value of the density, rho as a function of r, what is dm of r? Four, four pi r squared. R squared. Yes, four pi r squared. Did we all say the same thing. Row of r dr. <laughs> What's that? Did we all say the same thing? I know, it's pretty high well, enough. I'm thinking, ah. You've heard beautiful. all the letters at some point. <laughs> That's right. That's why it's four, four, pi squared, 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 there's a row in there somewhere. Rochelle. That's right. Yes. Rochelle. 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 So therefore, rho is one over four pi and stop me if I'm wrong and make this up as I go along. Rho then is one over four pi r squared dm dr, right? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Can't do that. But for our constant rotation curve, if b is a constant then we're differentiating r v squared over g. Hmm. Right? I can easily differentiate r v squared over g with respect to r. It looks like v squared over g to me, right? So, yeah, I put it into Mathematica. So, a flat rotation curve implies that rho falls off like 1 over r squared. So this is a, this is a simple case of deducing 
what is the density distribution, assuming it's spherically symmetric, based on the rotation curve. So we can infer from the flat rotation curve that the dark matter should be centrally condensed, denser near the center, less dense towards the edges, and it should fall off like one over r squared. There's a homework problem that explores that in more detail, where you assume that there is some mass at the center that's centrally condensed, and um, you basically you do a more sophisticated version of this in one of the homework problems. Okay, any questions? Do we use this fact to deduce anything about how dark matter interacts with itself? Um, I don't think so, no. I don't think that tells us that, okay. that particularly, because I mean, it does interact with itself gravitationally, and it, but it doesn't interact very strongly otherwise, or we would expect to see gamma rays from dark matter annihilating more than UV, essentially. <coughs> Let's review, there we go. Okay, onward to another topic now. So, the winding problem for material spiral arms. The winding. the winding problem, that's right. You get really winded studying these things. Or you get wound up, maybe. And in fact, our buddy Phil Plate talked about this uh, in the video that we showed. That um, I think you'll see in the video, I say, okay, Mark, now you just play these two videos and then come back when you're done. <laughs> I didn't put the videos on the YouTube. Oh, you edited them out? I edit, oh, I didn't even, I just stopped the camera. Uh -huh. I said, hey Mark, play these videos, stop camera. So you play the videos, okay. and in fact, uh, we verified that you can play them at two times speed, and Phil will just be optioning the material to you, but it'll sound <laughs> normal, so. <laughs> or, or half speed if you want, yes. Or put them in the YouTube video editor, speed it up to four times and then play it back normally and it'll just sound like a chipmunk. <laughs> anyway, um, spiral arms, it turns out, are actually waves in the disk. And we can infer this from the fact that they can't be quote unquote material spiral arms. It cannot be that the stuff in a spiral arm stays in the spiral arm because, and that's what we mean by material spiral arms. In other words, if we hypothesize the stars and gas and dust that are in a spiral arm are what comprises the arm, and as the galaxy rotates, the stuff that's in the spiral arm stays in the spiral arm. That's what I mean by material spiral arms. Of course, there's material in the spiral arms, but in other words, I'm saying, what if the stuff in the spiral arm stayed in the spiral arm? That would not work because the rotation curve of the galaxy is pretty much flat. So stars A, B, C, and D are all moving pretty much the same speed. But that means that they have different rates of going around the galaxy in terms of how much angle they cover, right? Because star A is moving on a circle with a smaller circumference than star B. Star B is moving on a circle with a smaller circumference than star C and so forth. So they're all moving the same speed, but A is going to get around the galaxy one time before B does, which is going to do that before C does and so forth. So after half an orbit of star A, stars B, C, and D have made less than half an orbit. After one orbit of star A, star B, which is twice as far away, still moving the same speed, will have only gone halfway around the galaxy. Blah, blah, blah. After two orbits of star A, we get this configuration. Star B has gone once around finally. Star C still hasn't even gone, what, you know, all that sort of thing, right? So if star C hasn't even gotten around once, neither has star D. So the idea then is that material spiral arms would suffer what's called a winding problem. And we know that it's a real problem because uh, the, the characteristic time for our galaxy, for example, to rotate is a couple hundred million years. The, gal the, the sun's orbital period around the center of the galaxy is around 225 million years or so. Um, how old is our galaxy? It's about as old as the universe. So a little bit younger. How old is the universe? 13.8 billion years is the current best estimate. So our galaxy is 
at least something like 12 billion years old, well, that means if it's spinning about where the sun is, if the sun is making about four orbits every billion years, then that means that in the time of the universe, it's gone around the galaxy almost 50 times. Well, the sun hasn't existed for the whole time the galaxy's been here, but stars in the sun's vicinity would have made 50 orbits by now. So in other words, um, a gal galaxies are much older than the characteristic time for them to spin once. So spiral arms would have wound up long ago if the material that, if what's, if what, you know, if what is in a spiral arm stays in a spiral arm, the Vegas theory of spiral arms, I guess. But wouldn't it not work like that because of the dark matter and the rotation curves? But the rotation curve is flat because of the dark matter. Oh. In other words, I'm using the flatness okay. of the rotation okay. curve here, right? It's important to realize those stars are all moving the same linear speed, but they have different angular speeds because if you're close to the center, covering the same distance means covering a bigger angle. So that can be a little confusing at first. Those stars are all moving the same linear speed, but that's, that means that stars closer in are gonna go around the center faster than stars further out because they have a smaller circumference to cover. I don't know how many times did we say the sun is going around the merry-go-round? Um, let's see if I did this right. If the galaxy is 12 billion years old, it takes the sun about a quarter of a billion years to go once around. So if the sun were as old as the galaxy, right. it's not, it would have gone around about 48 times. Now it's only, like five billion years old, so it's more like what twenty times or so that it's gone around the galaxy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Dinosaurs, sixty-five million years ago, so that's roughly a quarter of a revolution. So when the dinosaurs died out, the sun was about a quarter away from around the galaxy from where it is now. Mm -hmm. Totally different constellation back then because cool. there's enough relative velocity between stars that totally different. Big Dipper, what, like 50,000? In 50,000 yeah. years, yeah, the nice. Big Dipper will have noticeably distorted in shape yeah. from what it looks like now. Yeah. Stellarium has enough data to know that if you fast forward a couple thousand years, the constant, you can like track the yeah, constellations. Yeah, you can watch the things. Yeah, isn't that cool? Really yes, cool. I know, yes. <laughs> uh, right, so the constellations only seem timeless because we don't live long enough to notice that. <coughs> no, they're not. Yep, those change. If you watch a sped up video of the Earth, it would be like it's boiling almost, all the plate tectonics moving things around. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> okay, I don't like that. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> so indeed, spiral arms are actually what we call density waves. They're waves in the disk of the galaxy. And like any self-respecting wave, the idea is that, sure, the wave is, well, not all waves are waves in a material medium, but for the galaxy, the wave is traveling in a material medium, the disk of stars and gas and dust, but um, the individual particles, the stars and so forth, are not traveling along with the wave. Just like on the water wave, right? The ripples travel across the pond. <coughs> that doesn't mean individual molecules are traveling along with the wave crests. Uh, any individual molecule just kind of goes wee when the wave goes by, and, uh, and then it continues onwards. The analogy I like to use with intro classes is talking about the wave in a stadium. I mean, it's a perfect name for the wave that, that, for what happens in the stadium, because of course what happens is not, you know, one way to make the wave would be everybody stand, everybody in section J stands up and holds up their arms. Everybody else stands up and doesn't hold up their arms. Now, everyone run around the stadium, <laughs> right? That would get the held up arms to go around the stadium. But that's not, of course, what actually happens. No, you wait for the wave to come by and you go, woo! And you sit back down again, right? So the wave travels through the material, the people, but the individual people just jostle when the wave goes by. They don't travel with the wind. That's what the spiral density waves do. They're you're waves. What's that? And you're also making an analogy of like current in the wire, pretty much the same thing. Well, yeah, that's it, right. The, with the current in the wire, the electrons are crawling compared to how fast the effects propagate. Yep. So, uh, uh, spiral arms are density waves, and in fact, um, throughout most of the galaxy's disk, the waves are not traveling as fast as the stars and gas and dust are. So the sun, over its lifetime, 
has been in and out of spiral arms multiple times. It catches up to and overtakes spiral arms over and over again as it orbits the galaxy because it's going around the center of the galaxy faster than the spiral arms are. And um, in fact, when interstellar gas clouds, giant molecular clouds, pass through spiral arms, as we will see, uh, as Phil Plate called it a traffic jam, that's actually, it's an okay analogy, but it's not quite the same. They don't actually slow down <coughs> the spiral arms, as we'll see. But in any case, because of the enhanced density in the spiral arms, that causes the giant molecular clouds to crowd together compared to when they're not in the, in the when they're outside the arms. And so they collide with one another more often. And remember that GMCs colliding with one another is a way to set up shock waves within them that cause the initial compression that can make parts of them exceed the genes mass and initiate star formation. So that's why we see O and V type stars in H2 regions and spiral arms, because that's where the action is in terms of getting giant molecular clouds close enough to one another to bump <coughs> into one another and initiate star formation. And then the reason why the O and V type stars stay near the spiral arms is because, so it would take, it takes a star around a couple hundred million years to go once around the galaxy. How long does no star live, roughly? Not that long. Not that long. <laughs> got, a, got a numberish. 50 million years. Too much. 20 million. Mm, some maybe, but let's go with a Ten. few million. Yeah, 10 million years is kind of a good Ooh, canonical yes. number there. It takes you 200 million years to go once in a galaxy, and you blow up as a supernova after 10 million years, you've only gone about 1 20th of the way around the galaxy in your whole lifetime. So spiral arms are blue because that's where most of the O and B type stars are born, and they blow up as supernovae before they're able to travel very far from where they were born. And so spiral arms are lit up blue by the hot young O and B type stars that form. I'm still a little bit confused about the density wave. So it's not actually material? We, it, uh, well, of course it's made of material, right? Just like, like um, I'm talking to you, right? I'm sending yeah. sound waves through the room. Of course, the sound wave represents a pressure wave and a displacement wave within the material air in this room, right? Yeah. But when a sound wave front <coughs> passes by this molecule here, this molecule doesn't travel from my mouth to you, right? This molecule just goes Well, I'm making wonder, sound wonder, waves wonder, to wonder, wonder, oh, sorry, wonga, 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 wonga. It goes wonga, 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 wonga. The, the wave goes by, but it's not moving very much, right? Same idea. They, these are waves that travel through the disk of the galaxy, but the wave, the wave crest isn't traveling as fast as the material is. So stars are moving through the wave crests. And we are now going to embark on a rather elaborate mathematical model of what these density waves are. Just to jump ahead, on the right there is the idea. We will see that if you systematically tilt the orbits of stars in different parts of the disk, Notice that you can get a spiral pattern as a result of that. And the idea is, it turns out that, and this is probably be confusing for now, and I hope to clarify it when I do this not at auction speed. It turns out that this is actually, uh, these closed orbits that we see are in, not an inertial frame of reference, but in a rotating frame of reference. And in that rotating frame of reference, the stars have closed orbits. But because that's a rotating frame of reference, to see what really happens in an inertial frame of reference, you have to imagine this whole pattern spinning around. And as the pattern spins around, the, the spiral arms spin around. And so the spiral arms are regions where the orbits of the stars and gas and dust get closer to one another. So there's crowding because these stars come around the bend and then they literally get closer to one another as they pass through the spiral arm and then they spread out again after <coughs> they pass through the spiral arm. And then the whole pattern is rotating around what's called the global angular pattern speed. 
need. And so, uh, and so the idea then is that individual stars catch up to and pass through the wave front, the wave crest, but the wave crest itself also rotates at a slower rate around the center of the galaxy. So what caused this wave? That will be the topic that we cover after the break. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna say a lot about that. Wow, it's break time already. It's break time already, that's right. That's yes. not true. <laughs> what? Metaphor. I'm on the edge of my seat. You're on the edge of your seat, yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs>